that, I'd like to introduce uh, Brian King, Chancellor for the Los Rios Community College District. Thank you, John. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is exciting to be with you. I can't believe this is my fifth fall convocation here with you at Folsom Lake College. The years are flying by. I want to begin with some introductions. As you know, we have a convocation at all of the four Los Rios colleges each semester. So this is our fourth stop. So you need to really appreciate the people who have traveled with me and are hearing this presentation for the fourth time. Jamie and I are Vice Chancellor of Instruction and Technology. J.P. Sherry, our legal counsel, who's reminding me this is the fifth time they've heard it. We also have the presentation at the district office. <laughs> Teresa Matista, Vice Chancellor of, of Administration. <laughs> Gabe Ross, Vice Chancellor, Associate Vice Chancellor of Marketing and Communications. <laughs> Paula Allison, Associate Vice Chancellor of Philanthropy. <laughs> and I want to introduce my wife, Christina, who's here with us today. And we have some special guests as well. As you know, it's a big day in the life of the college here at Folsom Lake with a brand new president, Whitney Yamamura. And please welcome his parents, Sam and June Yamamura, who are with us today. Well, you already see what the people here think of your son, and I know you're very proud, as you should be, and uh, him having the, the chance to lead the great Folsom Lake College. So five years, it goes by very quickly, and you think about the many successes we've had in the last five years across our four colleges. Not that long ago, about five years ago, we were coming out of the Great Recession, and we should be very proud that I don't know another district in the state that went through the Great Recession without a single layoff and without any rollbacks in compensation because of good fiscal planning by our trustees. You heard from John Knight, another one of our trustees is with us today, Robert Jones, down in front. Robert, wave to the crowd. So that great leadership has been very important in weathering the tough fiscal times. We also have a new district strategic plan, and as we see, and we'll see today going through this presentation, we were anticipating the direction of our system very well in our strategic plan and other plans that have come into place. The strategic plan for Folsom Lake College, our technology plan, plans for basic skills, the student success initiative and equity plans. So much planning has taken place in the last five years. And at Folsom Lake, you think about how the campus has changed here at Folsom Lake where the tremendous athletic facility has been completed in the last five years. You are making a shift towards pathways and getting behind the transformation taking place. So many wonderful successes here at Folsom Lake College and uh, affirmation of accreditation. Everybody who was involved in accreditation, please stand up. Seven year re reaffirmation of accreditation for FLC. So it's a great foundation in the last five years, wonderful work that has been done. The next five years are going to be exciting. And to some extent, so much has happened. There's been so much change in the last five years. How many of you wish that change would slow down a little bit and that we could catch our breaths? I certainly feel that way at times. But as we prepare for the next five years, the reality is that things are going to happen very fast. And the planning that we have done, all those stacks of plans are, are going to lead to actions that are going to transform the lives of our students throughout the region. So we've done the planning. We've worked very hard. And the reason that we work so hard in establishing a great planning process is because we know what more Americans are coming to learn, the ugly reality that the gap between the rich and the poor in the United States is widening. And the most important factor to predict economic success is education. And you think around this room, how many of you have someone in your family or a friend who had just a high school degree and has done okay? You know, not that long ago, a high school degree was enough the reality now, coming out of the Great Recession, out of 11.6 million jobs that were created, almost all of them required a credential beyond high school. So we are on the front lines in preparing students for the new economy, which is very unforgiving for men and women who do not have a credential or a skill beyond high school. Some of them will need a four-year degree, but many will not to, uh, to have the kind of life that they want for themselves and that we want to help them achieve. 
So we have the planning done. You've done great work at the college. All of the Los Rios colleges have wonderful strategic plans. Now the pivot is from our strategic plan as a district, and we've discussed before that first goal on pathways. That first goal is establishing effective pathways for success and access, and both parts of the plan are important. For many years, we focused uh, very appropriately on access, but now we understand that helping students complete more quickly is an important part of what we do. So in pathways, there has been a lot of discussion about what pathways will look like here at Folsom Lake and at all of the Los Rios colleges. Some areas where there's wide agreement about what pathways will do, the four pillars of guided pathways. First is creating the pathways to employment and further education. Some of our students come to us and they, they, they let us know that they want to get to the world of work very quickly. Some of our students come and they want to transfer to continue their education at a four-year college or university. So creating those pathways both to employment and also to further education are very important. We want to get students on pathways as quickly as we can. Now that doesn't mean that there's no chance for exploration for students, but if we can narrow down the range of total choices, have them on a pathway moving towards their goal, it doesn't mean they're stuck on that pathway forever. If they find that their passion lies in another area, we want to move them quickly from one pathway to the other. And when they're on the right pathway, we want to be committed to keeping them on that pathway. And the fourth pillar underlines everything we do, the commitment to learning, that as a learning organization, everything we do is based on learning. So the four pillars are a really good overview of our efforts in establishing pathways. And I have said this every time to every group that we've ever talked about pathways. You are the builders of pathways for Folsom Lake College. My role as your chancellor is not to, to tell you what the pathways should look like. My job is to bring as many resources to your work and support you in any way that we can. And I think throughout our district, we understand we are a support organization to you at the college level. So we have subject matter experts here in student services and instruction. You know what's best for students. We're gonna help support you in doing the work in building pathways. And our efforts are very much in alignment with what's happening at the state level in both policy and funding. Our new chancellor, Eloy Oakley, championed $150 million to support guided pathways, one-time dollars for our state. And we anticipate our share will be about 6.1 million. That's really helpful as we implement and move from planning to action in creating pathways. We also received a $2 million innovation award from the governor and the Department of Finance. Thank you for the applause. That's worth applauding. <laughs> Wonderful example of partnership with all four colleges working together in a collaborative way to access funds that will help provide tools for implementing pathways and also an opportunity to extend partnerships with our K-12 partners because the pathways don't just begin at the doors of our college. We know working very closely with our high school partners and even middle school and elementary so that college going culture is created early on. We also are the only multi-college district in California that use the institutional effectiveness process in a collaborative way where we came together again as four colleges and talked about needs we had in terms of tools to implement pathways. And I'm happy to report we not only have been awarded a million dollars, our four colleges in the district combined, the money is in the bank. So that's another million dollars to help in our efforts. <laughs> who is this man on the screen behind me? How many of you know who that is? We have a new chancellor statewide, Eloy Ortiz Oakley. He followed our own Bryce Harris as chancellor, and he is off to a, a really great start as chancellor for our system. He started around the first of the year, and as I said, you know, one of his first signature po projects in the budget was the Guided Pathways dollar, so bringing $150 million into our system is a great accomplishment for a new chancellor. And a month ago, almost to the day, on July 17th, Chancellor Oakley released the strategic vision for the Community College Chancellor's Office. So we want to pay attention to this strategic vision. It will have an impact on the direction of our system and also the legislators and how they look at supporting our work. So how many of you have had a chance to look at the strategic vision? We'll share the link with you to the document next week in our follow-up uh, email about convocation so you'll have a chance to drill down. We're gonna talk only about the first of the six goals. I'm, I was really pleased to see that the goals in the, st the strategic vision are very much in, al in alignment with our strategic goals. The one on the top 
is degrees, certificates, credentials. And I have already noted that not all of our students come seeking a degree or a credential, but for those who do, we want to do everything we can to support them. And the majority of our students tell us that they want either a credential or to transfer. We certainly have students who are coming for uh, upskill classes to help them in their current job and not a degree. And we have members of our community who are coming to learn more about the world. And all of those are parts of our mission. But in, with respect to degrees and certificates, how, what percentage increase do you think Ch Chancellor Oakley is hoping that we can accomplish in five years, understanding that frequently our progress is incremental, where if we move a percentage point or two, that can be hard. How, how much do you think he is challenging us to increase our completion rate over five years? 20% over five years. 50 would be a better goal? The Chancellor's goal in the strategic vision is 20, and we could have the discussion, what is the right goal? But 20% is Chancellor Oakley's goal in the strategic vision. To get a sense of what that would mean for our four colleges, the last two years, we've had about 11,000 credentials. A 20% increase over a five-year period would mean about 2,000 more certificates and degrees. So it's certainly ambitious. It's also very possible Will we have that sort of change in outcomes without changing how we do things? And the answer is no, that if we're gonna have different outcomes, if we keep doing what we're doing, we'll probably have outcomes similar to what we're getting. So there's great energy, I can feel it here in the room, about looking at doing things differently, understanding that there's an important reason to consider doing things differently. And the policy trend is already moving in the direction to have funding based not just on enrollment, not just on access, but also on outcomes and how our students do. There are already examples of funding that is based on outcomes in the student success, the triple SP funds, and also in the strong workforce program. So we already have some funds that are linked to things other than enrollment. And when you look at Chancellor Oakley's strategic vision and the, the input we have from the legislature and other policy experts, likely that we need to be responsive to a shift in the funding formula based more on outcomes and not solely on enrollment. So uh, Chancellor Oakley has a workforce in place, a work group in place looking at the funding formula. So we will very closely monitor what happens in the Capitol and make sure that we're active participants in uh, thoughts about changing the funding formula with the understanding that change is almost inevitable in how we're funded. So risk at times we we desperately avoid risk, but in a volatile environment like this, we need to be willing to take some risks. Doesn't mean that we want to be reckless. We want to be very thoughtful about the risks we take, but uh, we want to try new things, and not everything we try will work. That uh, I love the quote in the Tech Museum in San Jose from Gordon Moore, if everything you're trying is working, you're not trying hard enough. So we'll try some new things that will be successful. We'll try some things that are not as successful as we hope. We'll do a blameless autopsy on the things that don't work and we'll move forward and take more calculated risks to make the changes that are necessary. So when you think about the speed of change, it can be disorienting. You think about all the things happening in our nation and in the world and, and changes that are not pleasant and how we react as individuals. And I, I think about being in your seat and hearing people come and tell me about changes coming and thinking that they're out of touch and in a different position and you're really having to do the work of change. So I was thinking about examples just in my own family about how change impacts us. And when we made the decision five years ago to come to Sacramento, I was very excited when I get the, got the call from our, our board of trustees. Uh, asking me to come serve as your chancellor. It's been a great privilege. I was excited. My wife, Christina, was excited as well. My son was in sixth grade. He was not troubled by the move. My daughter at that time, five years ago, was 13. She was less excited about the move. And uh, recently getting ready for college, she was going through a lot of her old documents, and she found her journal from eighth grade. And I thought I would share with you some of her thoughts about the move and her thought about the change. <laughs> so she starts off, I live in beautiful Santa Cruz where our family had been for nine years, and believe me, I do not want to move. No subtlety in uh, her resistance to the change. She was just getting started though. 
She continued, I would rather be cut with paper put cuts all over and jump into a sea of lemon juice than move. That's pretty vivid. How many of you have felt that way about change in your life? How many of you feel, about, feel that way right now as some of the changes we're talking about that you, you would rather not have to make the change? And then uh, she finally says, my dad will leave for the job, and I did come six months early. They finished the school year, and we'll be stuck here and only see him on weekends. I think I'll just cry and cry until my tear ducts burst. I'm glad I really didn't know that at the time, that it was that hard on her. But I don't want to live on, leave on a downer. She uh, wrapped it up by concluding that life sucks, <laughs> and she wants to trademark it, apparently. <laughs> so if you were thinking about using life sucks, Celia may have the intellectual property rights for that. <laughs> and in the coming weeks, there may be times where you hear about an idea, something we're talking about. You can just put the subject line, and your text can be life sucks, and I'll know exactly what you mean. So. Fast forward to five years, and now she will tell you that moving here was the best thing that's ever happened to her. She loves Sacramento. She is excited about her future, and it's easy to chuckle about a 13-year-old middle schooler resisting change, but now her mother and I are going through the different change where she's preparing for college and a part of our lives is over. And even though we know that's a good change, I have to admit I struggle with that change a little bit too. So I do understand that change can be hard, and as I look at her brother, he's, he's less saddened by her going to college. <laughs> so his perspective is a little different. So we all deal and struggle with change in our personal lives, both ourselves and those around us. Statewide, change is happening fast, and some things are just falling from the sky. Quick example, how many of you have read the May 11th letter from Governor Brown to Chancellor Oakley about online education? So I'll tell you on May 10th, I was not necessarily laser focused on online education. On May 11th, the letter came from Governor Brown to Chancellor Oakley instructing him by November, by November, so not very far from now, to present a plan for a purely online college presenting degrees for California community college students. So a new college was the concept. So we have spent a lot of time, as you would imagine, talking to faculty leadership, other constituents, talking to legislators, talking to the governor's staff, talking to our friends and colleagues in the chancellor's office about what this could mean. So uh, between now and November, there will be a proposal. Don't know exactly what that will look like, but we'll be actively involved. And one of the advantages of being in Sacramento is we are able to hold regular conversations with the policymakers and decision makers. So if you run into someone in the chancellor's office or in the legislature, and they mention that I've been talking to them about online education, that's absolutely true, because we want to make sure on an initiative like this, we've had a thoughtful conversation and are able to make a decision about whether there's a role for our colleges that would benefit our students in moving forward. Frequently, the month of August and even July is fairly sleepy as, as far as policy is concerned. The last 30 days has been very busy in terms of educational policy. Some of the, the changes you, you may have heard about on August 1st, Chancellor White for the California State University System issued an executive order saying that intermediate algebra may not be a required prerequisite anymore for certain non-STEM majors in CSU. So there's been discussion for a long time about what the right math is, and CSU is moving very quickly to make some changes in uh, what math is required as prerequisites at CSU. Could that have an impact on community colleges? It absolutely will. So it's important for us to be forward thinking about these changes and make sure that we have a role in determining what the impact is to make sure that it's a positive impact on our students. On the same day that Chancellor Oakley announced the strategic vision or released the strategic vision, he uh, was interviewed by the Los Angeles Times and suggested we should rethink the algebra requirement for community college degrees outside of STEM areas. So unlike the CSU system, Chancellor Oakley does not have the ability to issue an executive order, but he does have the bully pulpit to talk about changes that he thinks could benefit our system. And that's certainly not a new discussion, but a fairly provocative comment from the chancellor about a dramatic change in our system. Another executive order on August 2nd from CSU 
that Cal State will no, no longer require placement exams and is going to drastically uh, reduce and almost eliminate developmental classes at CSU. And think about both of those things, the huge impact that that will have on students throughout the region, that instead of placement exams being the primary tool for admissions and uh, placement, now CSU will be using high school grades, high school transcripts, and other information. Now that's not new to us. We've been having that conversation about what we call multiple measures to help place students, but it certainly speeds up the urgency of that discussion. And we do not have executive orders in our system statewide. What does happen sometimes, if the legislature thinks we're moving too slowly, they'll pass a law. An example of that concern in the legislature is AB 705 that would require community colleges to use high school placement data in, uh, in addition to placement exams and sometimes in the place of placement exams and also would shift the burden to community colleges to prove that assignment to a developmental class was necessary. So both parts of AB 705 could very much impact our community colleges in a way not dissimilar to the executive orders issued by Chancellor White at the beginning of the month. And AB 705 is rippling through not just policymakers. Last week I got an email from a mother who had read about the executive orders in AB 705. Her son is a recent high school graduate. Like a lot of our students, he was a good student, but maybe not a great student in high school. GPA of about 2.9, so he did his work. He graduated on time. Came to one of our colleges, took the placement test, and has been placed three levels down in math and two levels below college level, uh, college uh, English. So what looked like a two-year path for him now is a multi-year path beyond that. And I share that story with you not to suggest that he and students like him automatically should be placed in college level classes, but that we need to have a very thorough self-examination about the way that we do the sorting now. Is it working in the interest of students? And what are the ways that we can improve a process? Because helping students to completion is very, very important. And I, I'm happy to share with you one of many examples of our faculty and staff coming together to continue a robust dialogue about these changes. September 29th, Friday, September 29th, CRC is hosting a faculty discussion and wanted me to invite all of our college faculty and staff to come to participate at CRC in uh, room 104 in the LRC. And my hope would be that so many of you will want to attend this discussion that we'll have to find a bigger room because I think the discussion is that important and remaining engaged at the faculty and staff level is crucial. So change is happening fast. Standing still is not the best approach. In a time of rapid change, standing still is the most dangerous course of action. That's not what we're doing at Folsom Lake College. That's not what our four colleges in the Los Rios District are doing. We are moving, we're being very thoughtful about implementing our strategic plan. And when you think about pathways, two other ways to improve pathways are removing barriers and redesigning the experience for our students. So two barriers I want to share with you today, the cost barrier, and how many of you, your initial reaction is, we don't have a cost issue because community colleges are very affordable. Hold that thought for a second. And a second challenge is navigating a challenging system. Now, I, like you, have built the system that our students are navigating now through the years. So acknowledging that we could use better tools to improve the system is not a criticism of us. It's just an acknowledgment that the system we've built can be bulky for students. And there are tools and thought processes that can, can very much enhance the experience for our students. So we're going to talk about myths and facts. How many of you have watched the TV show Mythbusters? Do we have some fans? Anybody have a favorite episode of Mythbusters? There is a lot of objects being blown up in Mythbusters. So they, they tested the myth, could the Batmobile at high speeds turn a corner as quickly as it did in the movies? What do you think the answer is? The answer is no, that's a myth. They tested the myth through, I, I looked online, the, the number one favorite episode from those who voted. How many of you have a hot water heater in your ha house that's natural gas powered? You may want to Google this later on. The question was, is it a myth that a hot water heater could blow through the roof of a house? Is that a myth? That's a fact. It's explosively true. So the hot water heater went 300 feet in the air. So we're going to take the Mythbusters approach on the cost barrier. So the first question, 
Myth or fact, our students pay the lowest fees for higher education in the United States. How many of you think that's a fact? How many of you think that's a myth? It's actually a fact. Our fees are the lowest in the United States by a wide margin. The second least expensive state charges about 50% more than we do. So our fees are very, very low. And as you know, not only are our fees low, more than half of our students, the majority of our students do not pay fees at all. And you're familiar with the BOG fee waiver, the Board of Governors fee waiver. You may recall that I'm not a, whole, a big fan of the marketing of the BOG fee waiver. <laughs> I think we could do better. And news to share with you, our new chancellor and the chancellor's office is moving quickly to rebrand the BOG fee waiver to the Promise Grant. We could discuss for a while whether we think that's the right name, whether there's a better name, but I think it is indicative of the approach of our new chancellor. This will happen fairly quickly, and the Board of Governors will vote in September about rebranding the Board of Governors fee waiver, the BOG fee waiver, to the Promise Grant. So, First question, are our fees the lowest? They absolutely are. We have fewer students paying fees than any of the other states as well. So our fees are low. The question is, does that make us affordable? Because our fees are so low, are the out-of-pocket costs to attend less than a student if they attend UC or CSU? So let's say a student is choosing between Folsom Lake College and UC Davis. Where are the out-of-pocket costs lower? How many of you think that our out-of-pocket costs are lower to an independent, low-income student choosing between UC Davis and Folsom Lake? How many of you think our costs are lower? Okay, how many of you think that UC Davis is lower in terms of out-of-pocket? It's a myth that we have the lower total cost, and, and let's break down why. If you want to drill down deeply, there's a, a publication called On the Verge, printed by, published by the Institute for College Access and Success, TICUS, based in the East Bay in Oakland, talking about affordability. So even if you're in the back of the room, it doesn't matter, the little piece of pie is fees. So $1,400 in fees, we know that most of our students have a fee waiver. Our full-time students, 70% of our students statewide who are full-time are, are qualifying for the fee waiver. So the rest of the pie is all the other costs that our students incur. What are some other costs that students incur beyond fees? Books, housing, transportation, daycare, sometimes care for older aging parents. So a lot of costs overall. And the independent student uh, is not the student who's living at home with their parents. They're, they're having to find a way to pay for all of these costs. So, the total cost for a community college student who's independent, low income, are a little less than $20,000, but the total aid available is only around $5,000. So you look at the net cost, $14,000 plus for a full-time community college student out of pocket. The fees are lower free. It's all the other costs that are a huge barrier to our students being successful. And pause for a second. We talk about pathways. We talk about cost. Those are not two discussions, those are one discussion. That a student on the pathway to completion is encountering a huge barrier with these costs the longer they spend at any sector of higher education towards their goal, the less likely they are to complete and the more that they're paying. And we think sometimes that we have a problem that our students are working too many hours. That's completely true that our students are working too many hours. The reason why is because they have a much higher out-of-pocket cost than the student attending UC who has much more grant and aid and is only paying 5,500 out of pocket. So UC students, low income students are working less than community students and it's a cycle that we need to break. So you may wanna to say to me, and you would be correct, my job is to change the policy, increase the number of Cal grants that our students receive. I agree completely. I have advocated in the legislature. I will and will continue to advocate for more aid. That is not easy to do in the current budget climate, and where, where would those dollars come from? So let's talk about some things that, that all of us can do and that you can do in the classroom. How many of you are a classroom instructor that has course materials for your course that students have to get? How many of you require some materials? So the average student nationally is spending about 1,200 bucks on those course materials. I'm not saying that we haven't cared forever about course materials, but I wonder if the fact that our fees are so low 
have prompted us not to think as deeply as we need to about the cost of course materials. Because if, if we're thinking we're a very low income, uh, a very low cost opportunity for low income students, maybe we haven't thought as deeply as we need to about what that $1,200 cost means to a student who is very much on the margins. There are uh, better online materials than there have never been, ever been before. So I just challenge our faculty to look at the materials that you're requiring and, and think about whether there are open source materials or another way to provide without, without uh, changing quality. The quality of material students have is really important. But also keep in mind, uh, two thirds of students are not buying those materials no, ha no matter how good they are because of cost. So one area that we can work together to reduce the cost barrier is by thinking very seriously and thinking very hard about how we can reduce the cost of course material materials for our students. There are also ways that we can contribute to help students philanthropically, that uh, we have a, a student emergency fund. So if you take the time to go to the website for our foundation, even a small donation of five or 10 or $15 could be transformative for a student. And the broader point about pathways in addressing cost, if a student can com complete a degree more quickly and, you, and with fewer units, that is reducing the cost barrier. So the discussion of cost and pathways is not two discussions, it is one. So the cost barrier is a significant barrier for our students. Navigating a challenging system, I said before, it's not a criticism. We've all been involved in building the system. And over time, it's a matter of tools getting better that physicians 100 years ago cared very deeply about student health and helping patients get better. But how many of you want to go to that doctor's office today? You think about the tools they were using. We would rather go to a modern healthcare facility with state-of-the-art technology. The mission has not changed for the doctors and the providers. The tool, tools that they're using are better. So two major tools that the, the dollars we talked about at the beginning of the, the presentation, whether it's uh, uh, guided pathways dollars or innovation award or IEPI, we're gonna look at a course scheduling tool across the district. We know that offering classes at the right time and in the right sequence, and ideally in a year long sequence for students, will have a tremendous impact on their completion rate. So the course scheduling tool is one tool that we will bring to this work. It's not a new project. It's a way of bringing a tool to do the work that's already underway better. And a second example of those tools is, is the student experience lifecycle tool. We know that if we, can, uh, know, if we can have a better understanding of when students are struggling from their first contact with us through the different courses they're taking, and that's the goal of the student experience lifecycle tool to allow us to know when students are struggling on their path and react before it's too late. So it goes back to those four pillars again. These tools are not new initiatives. They're uh, having better tools to help us look at four pillars, creating pathways to, uh, to work or to further education, getting students on those pathways as quickly as we can. Once they're on the right pathway, keeping them on that pathway and keeping learning central to the whole process from start to finish. Now, in some ways, it seems like pathways is something we haven't done before, but you know we have. And I, I know we can go to scale in a, a broader way because of the success of a wonderful pilot uh, example of, of pathways, the associate degree for transfer. How many of you have been involved in developing associate degree for transfers? So uh, last week in the Sacramento Bee, there was an article with great news about the success of associate degrees for transfer. So our students who don't have an associate degree for transfer, transfer, what percent of those students do you think complete two years after transfer? So they've completed with us, they're not in the ADT pathway. 30% complete in two years after transferring with a non-ADT degree. For the associate degree for transfer students, this is the difference between 31% and 48. So 17% higher completion rates for associate degree for transfer. So it's a pathway program. We work together collaboratively across our colleges and also with our colleagues at CSU. It's making a difference in the lives of our students and think about that. That's 17% of the transfer students who are not needing a third year at CSU and all the costs that go with it. So we can do this pathways work. We already have, now we're just going to the next level and getting better tools 
to, uh, to be even more successful. So in closing, this spring, at the request of our faculty leadership and other constituent groups, it's been more than 10 years since we've held a district-wide convocation. So in January, we'll come together. We've just started working on the logistics and look forward to your participation about how to make a district-wide convocation uh, the effective uh, chance to come together with, that we know it will be. So I'm excited about having so many smart people together in one place and a chance to talk about the work that is underway. Now you know where to get a hold of me. If something has resonated with you that you want to let me know about or something that you want to share a question about, always feel free to send an email to me. I look forward to, uh, to your feedback and value it greatly in learning how best to support you in the work that's, that's moving forward. So that concludes my presentation. I want to ask Whitney to come forward now. I'm going to tell the people here something that they already know. But first of all, I want the search and selection committee that was involved in identifying Whitney to stand so we can thank everyone who was involved in the interviews. And if you went to thank an you. impressions group, <laughs> they did a great job. And as you get acquainted with Whitney, he's worked at three of our four colleges before, so he understands how unique the cultures are at the different places. I just can't tell you how excited I am to have Whitney as the new president at Folsom Lake. And I also want to take this opportunity before passing the baton to thank Kathleen Kirkland for her tremendous service as interim. <laughs> Kathleen. Many of, you, many of you have already had a chance to, to meet Whitney, and those of you who have not had a chance to say hello, please do so. You're going to find out that he's smart. He's really smart. He works really hard. He loves this place. I think the, the committee understood that he wants to be here and wants to be here for a long time. He cares deeply about our students. And uh, he is going to fight for Folsom Lake and to make sure that you have the resources you need. And he also understands that there are a lot of instances where working together for our four colleges is very much in the interest of our students, that those two things are not mutually exclusive, that you can be an advocate for the college and also a champion of students and, and collaboration among our four colleges. So nobody's more excited than I am. I want to welcome Whitney, and please join me once again in welcoming your new president, Whitney Amamura. Thank you, Brian. That's very kind of you.